Ahoy hoy, I'm Planner Walk, and today we are finally on to pseudoscientist number three. That is right, we have entered the top three. I myself am certainly excited to see what comes up here because we are no longer talking about flat earthers, although today's pseudoscientist does have a lot of flat earthers as fans, even though he himself is not a flat earther. He has stated that the earth is definitely a ball or a sphere. Ball. I'm, I'm repeating the word ball for certain people out there that don't want me to say that word. Ball! Sphere. I would say that if you're a channel discussing science related topics and you are attracting flat earthers as part of your audience, you might want to ask yourself why that's happening. Anyway, this is a Ken Wheeler video, so clear your counter space, prepare some word salad, and join me for whatever he's about to say. Um, there's something you need to look up. You could find a thousand pictures of it and you can go like the Wikipedia page too. Type in spherical harmonics. Yeah, spherical harmonics. Okay, so it's very telling here that he's telling people to go look at pictures of spherical harmonics. When you look at pictures of it, you get nice pretty images like this. However, if we just scroll down the Wikipedia page, we get a, a lot of mathematics. A lot of mathematics. A lot of mathematics. I don't understand half of this. I kind of doubt that Ken Wheeler understands even half of that. Um, the conjugate geometry of the entire universe, once again, of course, is the hyperboloid in the torus. Torus, of course, is magnetism, which is the extrinsic side of the dielectric. The loss of energy or inertia manifests as a three-dimensional force vector. That is the torus, and the hyperboloid, where the hourglass shape, is the geometry of increasing inertia acceleration to the plane of inertia, i.e. the dielectric, all of which, both of which, superimposed upon one another, are centered at this uh, point of inertia, not the plane of inertia, but at the point of inertia. I remember why Ken Wheeler videos are so difficult to make now, because of these long, run-on sentences that contain word salad that I've already heard a thousand times. He likes to talk a lot about the geometry of the universe as if that's supposed to mean anything. I could take any shape and say that that's the geometry of the universe. I could take a sphere and say that that's the geometry of the universe because so many things are spheres. It doesn't really mean anything though, but if you put enough words there, you can make it sound as though you know what you're talking about. It's a classic trick of narcissists who want to depower the metaphorical substrate of our culture by manipulating the intellectual potential of impressionable minds using anti-academic constructs. And if you don't understand what I just said there, then clearly you're just not smart enough to understand it. That point of inertia in the case of an atom, which I've said humorously, I've called it hard light. It is super high energy light. I made a prediction years ago that uh, super high energy light would uh, manifest uh, primordial matter, and of course the most fundamental matter is hydrogen. All atoms are just nothing other than compounded hydrogen. So it sounds like he's calling protons hydrogen, and yes, a lone proton is a hydrogen ion, but that doesn't mean that hydrogen is a proton. So there are isotopes of hydrogen, like deuterium and tritium, which also contain neutrons, and often hydrogen also contains Electrons. And that was discovered last year when two in-phase lasers at extremely high power uh, were brought in constructive interference, not destructive, of course, and they manifest matter. Well, kind of. They create W bosons. Now, you can try and say that W bosons are matter because they have mass, but in physics, matter means that it's made of fermions. Now, W bosons can decay into a couple things, like a lepton and an antilepton, or a quark and an antiquark. Now leptons and quarks are considered matter, but not the hydrogen that Ken was talking about. Now leptons are your positrons and electrons. Uh, positrons are not protons, they're electrons, but positive. Now as for quarks, we all know that protons and neutrons consist of three quarks each. Now if you've produced a quark and an antiquark, you do not have a proton or a neutron, you instead have a meson. So that's not exactly producing hydrogen as Ken was trying to make it out to be. There is also a discussion to be had about what constitutes matter and why, but that is a discussion for a different video. Anyway, here's a, a chart of several different geometries <coughs> of, uh, of a spherical harmonics. Ken, you should really start learning how to edit your videos because that was very difficult to see. Here you can see a donut around a hyperboloid, and you can see various hyperboloids around each other. These are just the spherical harmonics of various atoms, and of course, whenever you take the snapshot, you'll get a different spherical harmonic. So they're actually showing you a lot of the different shapes of really one thing. 
oh my god, Ken Wheeler actually sort of got something right for once. Because spherical harmonics can be used to describe the shape of electron orbitals. Good job, Ken. Now let's hope that Ken Wheeler now accepts quantum mechanics, because if he doesn't, the whole spherical harmonics thing kind of breaks down. Keeping Mother Nature really simple, because she's a hairy armpit chick with muddy feet and a hemp skirt, and she doesn't have a calculator. The only thing she does is pressure mediation. So you're saying that Mother Nature doesn't use a calculator or anything. You're talking about spherical harmonics. So do you want to explain what all this is then? Because this looks like mathematics, and mathematics that is well beyond my pay grade. Centrifugal divergence, centripetal convergence, force in motion, and inertia and acceleration. And the interplay between those two, of course, is constructive and destructive interference. These are the harmonics of the entire universe, as you can see that underneath the ferrocell. cell. Okay, so these are the spherical harmonics of the manifestation of the interplay between magnetism and dielectricity. Okay, Ken, I tried to search this entire Wikipedia article for the term interference. Not once in the entire article on spherical harmonics does the term interference show up. It's almost as if Ken has no idea what he's talking about and just says words because they have some kind of vague association with each other. So fundamental matter, or the atom, let's just take the most simple atom, of course, which is hydrogen, and we can see trillions of tons of that being emitted out of black holes. What? Ken, you're going to need to provide a really big citation on that one, buddy. Is actually being emitted at uh, the geomagnetic precession of these black holes. They're actually, you find pictures of them, real pictures, not interpretations of this. They're under galactic jets or astrophysical jets. Okay, so galactic jets aren't matter being emitted from black holes. Galactic jets are matter being accelerated close to the speed of light. If only I had a dollar for every time that Ken Wheeler misunderstood something. Both of these phenomena are exactly the same thing. This is a ZTP or a zero time particle with a spatial um, spherical frequency. A spherical frequency, of course, would be an atom. Okay, what in the bloody blue blazes is a spherical frequency? I searched up spherical frequency and the first page that comes up is the Wikipedia page for spherical harmonics. I searched that page for spherical frequency and it had no mention of that. Now when I searched for the phrase spherical frequency, there are two different but similar things that come up. Spherical frequency selective surface or spherical frequency space. Neither of these have anything to do with atoms and instead have to do with surveying by the looks of it. It sounds like Ken Wheeler heard the term spherical harmonics and thought, well, harmonics has something to do with frequency, so therefore we can just go spherical frequency. It's amazing that we think these are different things. Gamma radiation, x-rays, UV, visible light, radio, they're all exactly the same thing. They're only typified in distinction attribution by frequency. So yes, the difference between the different wavelengths of light is the fact that they have different wavelengths and thus different amounts of energy. I think most people know that. I don't know, maybe it's news to some that UV light and radio waves are both light. And wavelength, specifically light as a coaxial circuit. The longitudinal rarefaction and compression are that thing which these so-called scientists are not actual scientists, they're atomists and relativists, they call that the photon, or the light particle. There is no such thing as a light particle. It's rarefaction and compression along the dielectric, or the, uh, the, uh, the line of propagation of this light, of course. I wonder if he's figured out by now that photons are used because light can act as if it's a particle. I mean, there is a reason why it's sometimes treated as a particle and sometimes treated as a wave. Then again, we have to talk about light not actually being an emission. What's being disturbed, of course, is the medium. This is the reason why Nikola Tesla said light is a sound wave in the ether. But Ken, there is a small problem with that, very tiny problem, and that is the fact that the ether does not exist. Well, sound's not an emission, it's a disturbance due to the release of energy. As my vocal cords vibrate, it's disturbing the oxygen and nitrogen out of the air. So-called speed of sound, of course, is a misnomer. It's the rate of propagation of the medium against the self. The same is true of light. If light needed a medium to travel through such as the ether, then the Michelson-Morley experiment would have found that. I get the feeling that Ken, along with a whole lot of flat earthers, don't actually understand the point of the Michelson-Morley experiment. But with Ken, he believes that the Earth is a globe traveling through space. Flat Earthers at least get to use the excuse of, well, Earth is stationary, that's why we can have an ether. 
I'd really like to know why Ken thinks that the Michelson-Morley experiment didn't disprove the ether. Speed of light's not constant, it changes uh, due to whether it's passing through glass or water, but it's not actually passing and it's not an emission, but all of us human beings suffer this ignorance. Okay, so the speed of light is a bit of a misnomer here because when people say that the speed of light is constant, what they're referring to is C. And C refers to the rate at which information can propagate, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. Now light slows down in different materials, not because C changes, but because of oscillations from electrons in those materials. This causes interference with the light, which makes it appear as though it's slowing down. You have no rarefaction and compression of the dielectric. This of course would be the photon of the light particle i.e. the proton. Yeah, light cannot be turned into protons, at least not with our current capabilities, Ken. And all free neutrons become protons after 17 minutes. This means that which we call a neutron is nothing other than a modality of a proton. Well, neutrons aren't just simply protons. In fact, free neutrons have more mass than free protons. They can decay into protons, and when they do, they emit an electron and an antineutrino. And all the greatest experts of field theory say there's no such thing as an electron particle, which is true. There is no such thing as J.J. Thompson discovered, same, called it one unit of dielectric induction. Eric Dollard, uh, Nikola Tesla said there's no such thing as an electron particle. Uh, Oliver Heaviside, on and on, no such thing. It's funny that when I try to find that quote by J.J. Thompson, all I can find is people saying, J.J. Thompson said this, and that disproves the electron. Who knows, maybe he did say that, but it does sound like Ken Wheeler made it up, especially considering that J.J. Thompson did discover the electron. And also, if it weren't for electrons, then you have to re-explain the entirety of chemistry. This means there's only one fundamental particle. That one fundamental particle is just super high energy light. I mean, yeah, if you say that protons are the only particle and that they're made by light, I guess, but that's not how reality works, Ken. We haven't managed to turn light into protons, only into W bosons, which then convert into either leptons or mesons. So if we have a frequency that's so high that everything becomes overlapping, we don't have a, a set frequency. What we have is super high energy. Frequency is so high that we can't actually use the word frequency anymore. What we have now is not frequency, but Spherical harmonics. Oh man, this makes Mother Nature really simple. Simple, he says. Ignoring the fact that there is a lot of complicated maths that even I don't understand involved. He's also ignoring the fact that the spherical geometry he's referring to describes electron orbitals. You know, electron orbitals for those non-existent electrons, I guess. What if you could stick all of nature, all observed phenomena, in a simple little list, what happens when energy gets so high that frequency is indiscernible? Oh, you would have no longer rarefaction and compression. You would have this constant, however you'd have a harmonic, this constant light particle, that which we call a photon and the electrostatic generator measured in picometers around this light particle, which is the inner atomic volume of any and every atom, but let's just keep it simple and talk about hydrogen, we'd have, uh, we'd have a spherical harmonic. I hope he realizes that under classical electrodynamics, creating W bosons from light is just simply not possible. Instead, you need quantum electrodynamics for that, but also, also, I know that Ken Wheeler does not like Einstein and does not believe the things that Einstein said. But converting light into W bosons and W bosons then decaying into something like, let's say, mesons, that is only possible if E equals mc squared. Furthermore, for the people at CERN to get the energy to convert photons into W bosons, they relied on length contraction. If length contraction weren't a thing, then there wouldn't have been enough energy for those photons to convert into W bosons. I have heard Ken Wheeler harp on about Einstein enough to know that he thinks relativity is trash. However, he needs relativity in order to be saying half the stuff that he's saying right now. And even then, he's not getting the stuff that he's saying right! This is why we see trillions and trillions of tons of hydrogen being emitted from black holes. Hmm. Yeah. It's so high there's not frequency anymore. Wow, it sounds like everything that he's got to say relies on the previous misunderstandings that he's had. What happens when you turn up the capacitance so high that the frequency essentially vanishes? 
It doesn't totally vanish, it transforms into something else. There's no longer frequency and wavelength. What we have is spherical harmonics. Yep, it's just misunderstandings. Let me paint a picture here for you. He's claiming that you can turn light into hydrogen, which can be represented by spherical harmonics. In reality, light gets converted into a W boson, which can then decay into either leptons and antileptons, or into a meson. None of these are hydrogen atoms. Furthermore, Ken would probably say that leptons don't exist because an electron is a type of lepton. Now let's say that after all that we were left with a lone proton. Well, that still would not be able to be represented by spherical harmonics because remember, spherical harmonics represent the electron orbitals. Do you see how many levels of misunderstandings there are here that his entire argument is built upon? Like he's right about spherical harmonics being able to represent atoms. And I want to give him credit for that. But he's wrong about literally everything else that he uses to get to that conclusion. You can type this in. You'll find a thousand different charts like this. Some of them are colorful and pretty. Pretty type in spherical harmonics. You'll see something like that. Yeah. You just ignore all the mathematics involved because I don't think Ken Wheeler wants you to see how complicated it is. What? Well, that is interesting. It makes it kind of simple. Simple? You call this simple, Ken? Have you not read the Wikipedia page which goes over all this maths, which is certainly not simple? Compound frequency, just like upper and lower sideband, we have spherical harmonic. He's really just saying words like they mean something, and I think spherical harmonics is his new favorite word, and he's just going to insert it everywhere. Except the upper, si upper sideband and lower sideband of a, of a fundamental particle, i.e. hydrogen, would be spherical harmonics. Mmm. Please, Ken. Stop saying spherical harmonics when you don't understand what you're talking about. Super high energy light is fundamental matter. Except now, since there's no more frequency because the frequency is so high, we have something else. We have spherical harmonics of a pulsing atom. How do I turn him off? This has got to stop. He's repeating the same thing over and over again. He said spherical harmonics too many times now. Isn't that brilliant? Look at that face. He knows what he's doing. He made this video specifically so that I would see it and so that he could drive me crazy. Isn't it brilliant? What about unstable spherical harmonics? Why, unstable spherical harmonics is in the case of like radium, uranium, plutonium, lots of other different elements. Yeah, these unstable spherical harmonics would be beta and gamma emitters. Oh my! Isn't that neat? Okay, so the reason why a nucleus may emit gamma radiation is because the nucleus is in a high energy state. Typically, particles want to be in lower energy states, so they can do this by emitting photons. And that is why some nuclei emit gamma rays, not because of the spherical harmonic stuff. Now, beta decay has two forms, beta plus decay and beta minus decay. So beta minus decay is when a neutron decays into a proton and it emits an electron and an antineutrino. Beta plus decay, on the other hand, is when a proton decays into a neutron and emits a positron and a neutrino. And when these decays happen, it can leave the nucleus in a high energy state. And I hope you know what happens then. If you don't know what happens then, you weren't paying attention to me. You certainly don't need frequency to explain this or spherical harmonics because as I said, spherical harmonics are about the electron orbitals, not the nucleus. Oh, that's so simple. Unstable, super high energy spherical harmonics are themselves emitting light. The nucleus isn't the thing that spherical harmonics represent, you absolute dolt. This makes explaining atoms really simple. Spherical harmonics. Brilliant. Okay, I'm done. You're probably annoyed at having to hear the phrase spherical harmonics over and over and over again. I am too. He says it in such a way that it doesn't even mean anything. He took something that has meaning and managed to make it meaningless. Congratulations, Ken. But anyway, I'm going to leave this video here, so leave a like and subscribe if you liked this video. Be sure to join me tomorrow for the penultimate video in the series, which, due to a mistake that I made right at the beginning of the series, gives this series kind of an interesting symmetry to it. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons, Hugh Jars, the MC Nutkin, Shaki, Jet Alone, Nathaniel Muller, Vermont1777, Wolfie, Mori, Grandma Ghost, Kid Vicious, Sarcha Campbell, Kit McKinnon from Kitten Town, Craig D'Amelio, Nathan Thompson, and Richard M. Chapman. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, spherical harmonics, spherical harmonics, spherical harmonics.